Everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today, we're going to talk about five of the best financial decisions you can make as soon as you graduate from college. But before we jump into the video, make sure you give it a like, make sure you subscribe to the channel, and that will help greatly with the YouTube algorithm. I really appreciate it. I know there's a lot out there in the media right now that talks about how college is a bad thing for our country, how it doesn't prepare people for the real world, how it doesn't actually help you get a job. I think a lot of this is untrue. I think college definitely has its place in our society. Is the system perfect? Definitely not. It has its problems, but it also can provide a lot of value if people choose the right major and seek a career that can pay off in the long run. But that being said, one of my biggest complaints about college is that while it can be a great way to teach you how to make money, once you graduate, it doesn't actually show you what to do with that money. That's why Americans have such big issues with credit card debt, with taking out car loans that they can't afford, and why financial literacy in our country is so low. So if you find yourself in this situation where you just graduated from college, you just joined the workforce, you don't know how to manage your money, hopefully this video will help give you some tips on how you should start out. Number one, and this one starts with a caveat. Only if you are responsible with debt, you should get a credit card. And no, I'm not telling you to do this for the travel hacks. I'm not telling you to do this to build up points. The reason and the best thing a credit card will actually do for you is it will help you build credit history, which is also commonly referred to as your credit score. Now, your credit score is essentially a score that shows lenders how reliable you are to pay back your debt. And why is this important? Well, if you have a great credit score, it's really going to help you buy a house or buy a reasonable car. So why is that important? Well, when the time comes that you want to buy your first house, it's going to make your life so much easier to easily get approved for a loan, which can be difficult for a lot of people when they're buying their first house. So that's why it's helpful. But what factors actually go into making up your credit score? Well, there's five key areas that are considered when calculating your credit score. The first part of your credit score is your payment history, which looks back and determines how often you make on-time payments on your debt. You want this to be 100% on time. You don't want to miss one payment or it'll have bad negative impacts on your credit score. This area alone makes up 35% of your credit score. So it's very important and very critical that you make sure you make all of your debt repayments on time. The second area of your credit score is credit utilization, which is essentially measuring how much credit you have available to you and how much of that you're actually using. You want this percentage to be as small as possible. For example, let's say you have a credit card that has a max limit of $10,000 and you charge $5,000 to that credit card. If this is your only credit card, your credit utilization would have been 50%. And just for the record, that's super high. The main point with this is that lenders want to see that you have a lot of credit available to you, but that you're responsible enough not to use it. And you can make sure not to have high credit utilization just by paying off your bill every month. This one makes up 30% of your credit score, so it's also very critical that you make sure you have a low credit utilization. The third factor in calculating your credit score is length of credit history which is pretty simple. Lenders wanna see that you've had credit for a long time. So the longer you have your credit card open, the better that will be for your credit score, assuming that you pay it off on time. This is why I recommend getting a credit card ASAP. And length of credit makes up 15% of your credit score. So it's not as big as those other two categories, but it's still important. The fourth credit score factor is mix of credit types which basically means that lenders want to see that you have a bunch of different types of loans. So they want to see that you have a mortgage, um, a reasonable car payment. They want to see that you have credit cards. This shows that there's multiple areas of your life that you have debt in, but you're also very responsible with. Now, I think this one will sort itself out. I'm not telling you to go open a bunch of loans to work on your mix of credit types. Don't use this as justification to go buy a brand new car. Don't go start financing a bunch of unnecessary purchases that you want. Like I said, as you go through life and you make good financial decisions, this one will work itself out as you start to build up a portfolio of good loans that lenders can see. This one makes up 10% of your credit score. So it's smaller than some of the other categories, but every little bit is important. And the last factor in your credit score is new credit applications. So if you apply for a bunch of credit cards, or you go and apply for a bunch of loans, those will actually ding your credit score a little bit every time you do that. And this only makes up 10% of your credit score. So again, not as important. But it's something to keep in mind. You don't want to get your credit checked by lenders often. I know I touched on this briefly already. Why does it matter that we take care of our credit and establish credit? It's mostly going to benefit you when you go to buy your first home. When you go to apply for a mortgage on your first home, you're not going to have any prior mortgages and you likely won't have any car loans either, which means you have no credit history. This can make it very tricky to get funding when you're trying to buy your first house. Just having a credit card can make your life way easier. When I turned 18, I opened my first credit card and that alone was enough to get approved when I went to buy my first home. It was super easy and I got approved almost immediately. 
According to CBS, the average home buyer in America is in their mid 30s. So the sooner you get started on this, the better. And if you start now, right as you get out of college, you probably don't have to wait till your mid 30s to buy a home, assuming that you're able to save up a good down payment. And you don't have to go crazy on spending on your credit card either. I know that credit cards are scary. They're very predatory. You have to be extremely careful with them. If you're not responsible with credit cards and you know that, don't follow this advice. They're not for you. I don't want you to jeopardize your financial future. So if credit cards scare you, just charge a couple things to your credit card every month and then pay your entire balance off in full every month to avoid paying any interest. I'm pretty sure when I first got my credit card, all I was putting on it was gas and that was enough to establish credit. Just make sure this thing turns into a blessing for your credit and for your financial future and that it doesn't come back to bite you and cause you a lot of financial harm and stress. All right, that's it for credit cards. Now, the second thing that you should do as soon as you graduate from college is make sure you're paying attention and maximizing your work benefits. And again, I'm gonna give you another disclaimer. I know that probably the most important and most talked about work benefit is retirement and the 401k. I'm gonna push that off to another part of the video, but don't worry, we'll get back to it. Now, the next most talked about benefit is health insurance. And to break it down quickly, there's three main factors that go into calculating the price of your health insurance. The first one is your monthly premium, which is essentially just the monthly fee that you pay to be insured. Now, normally most employers will cover a portion or all of this monthly premium. The second thing that ties into how much your health insurance is, is your deductible. Your deductible is the amount of your own money you have to spend on medical expenses until your insurance kicks in. So for example, if you have a deductible of $1,000, you have to pay for $1,000 in medical expenses until your insurance kicks in. So if I go to the doctor and they charge me $1,000 for that service, I would pay that out of my own pocket and then my deductible will have been met, which means that for the rest of the year, my insurance is kicked in and will cover the amounts that we've agreed to as part of my insurance plan. And there's usually an inverse relationship between monthly premiums and deductibles. For example, if you wanna lower your monthly expense and have a lower monthly premium, um, then you may opt for a plan that has that, but also may have a higher deductible, meaning while you're paying less per month for your monthly premium, you'll have to pay more for your own medical expenses before your insurance kicks in. So let's say you lower your monthly premium to then have a deductible of $2,000. That means that instead of a thousand, like we just talked about, you'll have to pay $2,000 out of your own account before your insurance kicks in. Or let's say you wanna have a super low deductible. So you wanna pay less until your insurance starts to cover your health expenses. That likely means that you're gonna have a higher monthly premium or your insurance is gonna cost more money since it kicks in much sooner. And lastly, the third thing that goes into calculating the cost of your health insurance is out of pocket max. So once you've met your deductible, it doesn't mean that you won't pay another cent in medical expenses. It usually means that whatever percentages you've agreed to with your medical insurance provider, they'll cover their percentage and you'll still cover your percentage. So it's very common, for example, that once you've met your deductible, um, your insurance provider will cover 90% of a certain type of doctor visit while you're still expected to cover 10% of that doctor visit. That is up until you're out of pocket max. So for example, let's say your deductible is $1,000. Let's say your out of pocket max is $3,000. So let's say you go to the doctor and you spend $1,000 at that appointment. Again, you'd have to pay the first $1,000 of that to meet your deductible. Once you've done that, you've met your deductible, the rest of your medical expenses for the year are covered by your insurance. Then that your insurance covers 90% of all medical expenses for you, but you are still on the hook for that 10%. Well, you're only on the hook for that 10% up to $3,000 in total spend for yourself. So once you've spent $3,000 on medical expenses for the year, your insurance will then cover 100% of everything after that, as long as it's a qualified medical expense under your plan. So again, let's break it down. There is your deductible, which is the amount you have to meet for your insurance to kick in. And then after that, there's your out-of-pocket max, which means that after you've hit your out-of-pocket max, you won't pay another dollar in health expenses for the year. Now, I hope that helped break down the cost of medical expenses. I can't give you any advice on what is best for you because it really depends on the person. For myself, I usually choose to tend a plan that has a lower monthly premium, but a higher deductible just because I don't go to the doctor that often at this stage in my life, which means I can usually save money by spending less per month on my plan, but then I usually don't reach my deductible, which means that I'm just not spending a lot on medical expenses to justify having a more expensive health plan. But take my wife, for example, she's also very healthy, 
but she does have a lot of doctor's appointments that she has to go to. So we usually elect for a lower deductible plan for her, which costs us a little bit more every month, but then she's covered and we don't have to worry about any unexpected expenses coming up. So it really just depends. It doesn't mean you're healthy or not healthy, right? There's a lot of different scenarios for a lot of different age groups that could justify one version versus the other. So you really just have to break down your needs you have to break down what expected medical expenses you have and then come up with a decision that works best for you um, and your financial and health plan. If medical expenses stress you out, low deductible options are great because you'll be covered and you can have that peace of mind at night knowing that you're covered. But if you like to maximize your finances, then you may have more of a, more of a discussion on which one you should pick. And before we move on from health expenses, there's another key aspect to health insurance, and that is the HSA. And I freaking love HSAs. They get me so fired up. I could talk about them all day. They are the best investment account that you can use as far as a tax advantage situation. Now, an HSA is an investment account that is often a benefit that's attached to your health insurance. Now, to qualify for the HSA, you must have a what is considered a high deductible plan. So make sure that before you open an HSA, you have a plan that qualifies as a high deductible plan. A lot of times your employer will clarify that for you and you won't have to look into it on your own. But I want to include that caveat to make sure that I don't get any of you in trouble come tax season. So what is the HSA? Well, the HSA essentially offers a triple tax incentive, meaning that it combines the benefits of a Roth IRA and a traditional IRA with an added benefit for health expenses. So you can put money into your HSA tax-free, meaning that you don't pay taxes on that money that you put in. That money will then grow tax-free. So once it's in the account, you can invest it in different vehicles and you can watch it grow and you don't pay any taxes on that growth um, as long as it remains in the account. And number three, which is crazy, is you can also withdraw money from your HSA tax-free as long as it's used to cover qualified medical expenses. Now, there's a caveat that makes this even better. There is no timeline on when you can pull it out for those expenses. So for example, throughout my life, I can go throughout medical procedures, pay for them and keep receipts. Then when I hit age 60, I can go back to my HSA as long as I have receipts that I can use to prove that I have had these expenses during the time that I've had my HSA open. I can then withdraw the total amount that I have receipts for at that time, which means again, it's just growing tax-free and I can pull it out tax-free for the total amount of health expenses that I've had over time. Guys, this account is freaking awesome and you're not going to do better than this in pretty much any other account when it comes to taxes. I love these things. You can probably tell that I'm super fired up about them. Not a lot of people know about them, but they're seriously one of the best investment tools. One thing I'll add about them as well, what you're probably thinking is, well, what if I have too much money in my HSA and I didn't even spend that much in medical expenses over my lifetime? Well, good news. At age 59 and a half, it essentially turns into a traditional IRA, which means that you can then pull money out of the HSA, which means for any excess that you don't have qualified medical expenses for, you can pull those out at the normal income tax rate. So there's no penalty. You pay taxes on that like you would your 401k or a traditional IRA. But again, remember, if you have medical expenses that qualify for it, you can pull them out completely tax-free um, and you can leave it in there and let it grow and then continue to use it for medical expenses that come up. So I love HSAs. You should definitely look into having one if you can. Another key benefit I want to talk about is life insurance and specifically term life insurance. A lot of employers will offer great rates on term life insurance. It can be a really good way to set yourself up with that if you feel like you're in a stage of life where you need that. Again, very personal decision on the needs of you and your family and your dependents. Um, but I would say if you are married and have a spouse or you have children or you have people that depend on you for day-to-day -day living, um, even if your spouse works, I think it can be a really good idea to have term life insurance. But if you have any of those situations where you have dependents, you should sign up for term life insurance. And again, through your work can be a great way to do that. If you are single and you don't have a lot of dependents um, and there's not people that are relying on you, then it may not make sense for you and you can save some money there by not buying into that life insurance. But again, it's a very personal decision. There's a lot of very good reasons to have it and, and too many that I can really dive into. So just make sure you're taking a look at your personal situation and um, making a good decision on if having term life insurance is a good option for you. And another one of the best benefits is hitting the like button for this video for the YouTube algorithm. Again, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. But before that, we're gonna get to our third thing that you should do after you graduate from college, which is pay down debt 
and specifically pay down bad high interest consumer debt. Now, if you're already in a stage of life where you have a mortgage or you have a very reasonable car to get you from point A to point B and you have a low interest loan on that, that's not what I'm talking about. It may make sense as part of your financial picture to keep those loans, especially mortgage if it's a low interest rate. I'm not saying that you should throw everything at these types of loans. I'm specifically talking about high interest consumer debt. So this can be credit cards, right? Using a balance on a credit card to buy interests and wants and you know maybe even necessities, right? But these credit cards have extremely high predatory interest rates and it's going to absolutely kill you financially if you don't get these paid off. So make sure you pay off credit cards as soon as possible. It also might include a car if that car is not reasonable and it's something that you can't afford. It doesn't even matter if the interest rate is low, if your monthly payment is too high, and if the car is just too valuable for the stage of life that you're currently in, then you should either pay this off or you really should just sell the car and have that take care of the loan itself. Since this video is tailored towards people who've just graduated from college, let's talk about student loans for a second. It really depends. I have really strong feelings when it comes to our student loan situation in America. I totally understand that it is the only and it is sometimes the best way for a lot of students to go and get a college degree. But I just have a lot of strong feelings about the industry, about the issuers of these loans. That's for another video. For the purposes of paying them off, it really depends on the interest rate and it really depends on how much of a burden this is on your financial picture. If this is above 5%, which is what I would consider high interest, pay that sucker off, get it out of your life and get it done. If it's low interest, similar to a mortgage in a reasonable car, it may make sense to not pay it off immediately and put that money in other aspects that will make you more money, like investing that are putting in a high yield savings account. So it really just depends on the situation there with student loans. But just as a bucket or as a catch all, like I said, anything with a four or 5% interest rate or higher, that's when you should start to look to pay it off. Anything lower than that, you really can get a greater return on your money by putting it in some very safe investment options. And I know I just mentioned it, but I want to touch on cars really quickly. Right now in America, the average car payment per month is about $700. If you were to take $700 and invest it in the stock market over 40 years, we're going to assume an average rate of return of 8%, you would have $3.8 million in 40 years. I don't like any car enough to spend $3.8 million on it. Guys, car payments are one of the worst things about America. People are spending too much on their cars. It's ridiculous. Don't do it. Buy reasonable cars. Be frugal. Eventually, when you have a high net worth, that's when you go and buy nice cars and you have fun with them, but not now while we're building wealth. I see it all the time. There's always a new grad who goes out and buys an Audi or a BMW and says, I just graduated from college. I'm giving myself this awesome gift. Guys, debt is not a gift. It will ruin your financial picture, pay it off, sell the car. Again, I want you to have this car. I just want you to do it when it makes sense for your financial life. And just like I promised guys, the fourth thing that you should do once you graduate from college is start retirement investing. This is where we'll talk about the 401k and some of your options that you have when it comes to opening up a retirement account and starting to invest in your financial future. Again, similar to the HSA, I love investing. I love this topic. Ultimately, it's the best way for you to accomplish your dreams, to build the life you want to build. Um, and I love being able to teach people about that and help teach them what's possible just from a little bit of due diligence and a little bit of work. It's not a lot of work and I love it. Okay. Like I said, let's start with the 401k. The 401k is a retirement account that is typically offered with your employer. So it's an employer sponsored account where essentially a portion of your paycheck is taken out of your paycheck and deposited directly in into your 401k investing account. And that is why I love it. It's automatic. You don't have to think about it. It automatically comes out of your paycheck and goes into your 401k. Pretend like it doesn't exist. Don't feel like you're missing out on it. Let it go in your 401k. Make sure it's invested properly and let that grow for years and years and years. And even further, most employers offer a 401k benefit called the employer match, which means they will match a percentage of your contributions up to a percentage of your salary. So let's look at the following example. Let's say your employer matches 100% of your contributions up to 5% of your salary. Let's say 
say your salary is $60,000 per year and you contribute 15% of your salary to your 401k, which means that $9,000 are coming out of your personal paycheck and going into your 401k every year. Since your company matches 5% of your salary, they also contribute an additional $3,000 per year. It doesn't matter how much more you contribute to your 401k as far as the employer match goes, since they only contribute up to 5%, anything that you contribute above 5% won't be matched, but it's still a great idea to invest more to keep growing your retirement account. So when you take your contribution of $9,000 and combine that with your employer contribution of $3,000, that leaves a total contribution to your 401k of $12,000. And let's just say you did that for 40 years. And for the purposes of this exercise, let's say your salary doesn't change at all, which is super unrealistic. As you grow your career, as you do better, um, and as our economy grows, your salary will definitely increase from now to 40 years in the future. But again, we're just going to keep it the same for this video. If you did that for 40 years with an 8% return, you would end up with $3.2 million in your 401k just from investing 15% of your salary every month. You guys, this is something you have to do. I think the 401k is one of the greatest inventions in American history because it took investing to a very passive place where you don't have to manually put money in your account. It's just automatically taken out of your paycheck and deposit it into your 401k for you. Don't miss out on the compound interest, guys. Get started on this now and start building your future. Now, other than the 401k, there's a lot of other types of retirement accounts that I've already made videos on and I've already talked about in the past. Another common one is the Roth IRA. So if you're interested in the Roth IRA or other retirement investing options, make sure you check out my video where I compare the Roth IRA to the 401k. And while you're checking out that other video, make sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And before we move on from 401ks and retirement, I want to add one more bit of advice. Just because your contributions are deducted from your paycheck and automatically put into your 401k doesn't mean that they're necessarily invested already. A lot of employers have settings set up that will automatically invest those funds in the stock market and various diversified portfolios. And that's great. If that's the case for you, um, then you can either leave that or you can work with your financial financial advisor and your team to help you make the best decision there. But you hear these heartbreaking stories of people who will either put money in their 401k or within their IRAs or other retirement accounts. And they think that just putting the money in the account is what is going to invest it and let it grow over time. That's not the case. These are just accounts. If you just put the money in, it's not necessarily invested. You have to go in and actually select funds to invest that money in or else it might not be doing anything. So I'm not saying that's the case for you. Like I said, a lot of 401ks now will invest that automatically for you to help mitigate this problem. But I want to save you from heartbreak. If you are saving for retirement, go to your retirement accounts right now and make sure that money is actually invested and working for you. And if it's not, start to do your research, start to do your homework and potentially meet with a fee-based financial advisor to help you make good investment decisions on that so that that money can grow for you and build to retirement. And that takes us to step number five, which is our last step for this video. And that step is start to prepare to buy a home, but do not rush into it. Homeownership really is the foundation of the American dream. It's the way that most Americans build equity and establish a sizable net worth. I personally think it's a great goal that everyone should and everyone can aspire to accomplishing, especially in this country. But this is why I bring it up right now, even though you're just out of college and probably just starting to save for this. You should start to put money away for a future down payment on a house. And you shouldn't put this money in the stock market. You should put it somewhere very safe that you can access it. Hopefully somewhere that you can get a little bit of interest, but it's probably not going to be much. Somewhere like a high interest savings account. While you're doing that, you should also also spend some time analyzing different housing markets in your area. You should find out where you want to live. You should start driving around and seeing if those are areas you like and seeing if they're areas that you want to establish roots in. You should just do your research so that you know about the housing market in your area or in other areas that you potentially want to live in. Ultimately, this is going to make it so that when you decide to purchase a home, you're going to make a really good decision on where that should be. And you're going to make sure that you're getting a good deal on that house as well. And keep in mind, buying a house is an extremely emotional decision. People get so caught up in which house they want. They tend to lock in on a home and they love it. And a lot of times that ends up in people getting a bad deal. So as much as you can, I know it's an emotional purchase. I know there's so many life benefits that come from it that play into that one decision, but try to make the transaction as emotionless and as
as business-like as possible. View it as a financial step in your life to build wealth. You want to get a good deal on a house that's going to appreciate over time, that you're going to build equity in, and that you're going to be able to live in, but also it's going to be a financial blessing for you. And then once you do make that transaction and once you make that decision, yes, it's very emotional. You're going to love your house. It's where you're going to build your life. And there's so many benefits that come with that. But when you're actually buying it, don't think about that. Think about it from a financial aspect. And yes, buy something you want, buy something you're going to like, but try to be as data driven with that purchase as you can. I love being a homeowner. I do not regret my decision to purchase a home. I also say be patient because the housing market fluctuates. Over the last few years, we've seen insane demand for housing where people are just lining up just to hopefully put an offer in on a house and then they're paying way above asking. I don't want you to rush into a house and get pressured into a situation like that and end up getting a bad deal. Again, I'm not saying people in that situation got a bad deal. I really don't know. But save your money, be patient and wait for a good deal don't be emotional and don't get pressured into buying something that isn't right for you. I personally think buying a home is one of the best financial decisions I've made in my life. I love that a portion of my mortgage payment every month is going towards the equity of my home. I love that my house appreciates year over year. I believe that I made a good decision and bought in a good market um, and I've been able to see the results of that over time um, and I'm very happy with that decision. Again, it's not the best decision for everyone. There's definitely a lot of factors that come into play, but I think it's at least something that you should think about and start to plan and prepare prepare for, you know, even if you're not going to buy a house in the immediate future. Well, guys, I hope that video was helpful for you. I graduated from college four years ago and I had to figure a lot of this stuff out on my own just because I did not receive this base of knowledge when I was in college. So I hope this video was helpful. I hope these are steps and tips that are very applicable to you at this stage in your life. And I hope these ideas will get you on track to building substantial wealth in your life, um, which is a goal that I have for each and every one of you. So if you like this video, if you thought it was helpful, please please leave a like on the video. Please subscribe to the channel. I love making these types of videos. I love helping people navigate their finances and make good financial decisions. Um, so hopefully we'll see you guys back for the next one. I really appreciate it. Have a good one.